So there was a Russian history teacher, brilliant, brilliant pedagogue, extraordinary educator. Because of her skills in teaching history, a Chabad school in Russia hired her, even though she was a devout atheist. And you know there's no atheist like Russian atheists. <laughs> Besides Israeli left-wingers, they can do it a little better, maybe. But the Russians have a tradition, a certain of them have a tradition of atheism that runs very, very deep. She was an atheist, but they made up with her, don't mix religion, theology into your history classes. You teach history, and we're good. And she did a marvelous job. Kids were at the edge of their seats. You know, you can have history teachers that put you to sleep. You can have history teachers that mesmerize you. One day, they were dealing with the late 1800s and the early 1900s in Russia. And she decided to quiz her class, and she turns to the class, and she says, what was the most important event in Russian history in the year 1799? So one of the boys in the school says, 1799? It's the year when Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, and the Shulchan Aruch Harav, one of the great luminaries of Russian Jewry, the founder of Chabad, was liberated from czarist imprisonment of Powell the First. She lost it. She lost it. That 1799? Some rabbi who is irrelevant. They brainwashed you. They taught you garbage. I don't know if that rabbi ever existed. Even if he existed, it's irrelevant. Even if he's relevant, he should have been imprisoned. If he was in prison, he should have never came out. And even if he did come out, it's nothing to mention. 1799 is the year when Alexander Pushkin was born. Ooh. Now, since both of my parents are Russian, Yamalenka Gruzinchik, my mother was born in Kutais, and my father was born in Mamantovke, near not far from Moscow. So Pushkin was a household name by us, because my father loved poetry, and he loved Pushkin's poems. Now, you know that Pushkin is considered one of the greatest poets ever, and in Russian history, certainly one of the greats died at the age of 36 from a foolish duel. But his talent was unparalleled. And he was born in 1799. She says, that's the importance of 1799. Anyway, this Chabad Jewish religious boy looks up and tells each other, hey, Pushkin, so Zayn Pushkin. You want Pushkin? It's Pushkin. The teacher calms down. She continues the quiz, 1800, 1801, 1805, 1811, she turns to the class, what was the most important event in Russian history in 1812? 1812, the boy picks up his hand and he says, 1812, Pushkin's Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> now, <laughs> you wanna know what happened to the teacher? Cardiac arrest. <laughs> She's still, re she's still recovering. <laughs> God can be a big trauma. You know, my friends, I share with you this anecdote because it really describes the duality that each of us faces in our life. There was a bar mitzvah boy not long ago. He went to his mother and he said, Mama, Mama dearest, I want to give up a mitzvah speech. She said, great. What do you want to talk about? She said, I want to talk about where we come from. Where do we come from? 
So she tells her son about the ancestry, the family, the genealogy. No, no, he says the beginning. Where do we come from? All the way in the beginning. She says the beginning. God created heaven and earth. Adam and Eve and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah. They decided to have children for whatever stupid reason and here we are. The boy says, wow, he writes it down in his notebook and he goes to his father. His father was a graduate of Columbia University. Tells his father, where do we come from? Father tells him about the family. No, no, in the beginning, where do we come from? Father says, where we come from? We have evolved from the apes. What about the apes? They evolved from the chimpanzees. And what about the chimpanzees? They evolved from the monkeys. Where did the monkeys come from? They evolved, it took 15.3 billion years since the Big Bang. And from the prebiotic cholenter soup, the gases and the bacteria evolved, and here we are today. The boy was confused. He comes back to his mother. He says, Mom, I'm confused about the bar mitzvah speech. She says, why? He says, I ask you where we come from, and you tell me God, Adam, Eve, Abraham, Sarah. I ask Daddy where we come from. I ask Papa where we come from. And he tells me monkeys, apes, chimps, gas, and bacteria. Where do we come from? His mother looks at him and son, there's no consensus, son, there's no contradiction. You see, your father was talking about his side of the family. <laughs> Was talking about my side of the family. <laughs> my son had a bar mitzvah last week. Thank you, thank you. So he started off this speech with this joke. And I'm sitting there. <laughs> you know what they call it? Throwing your father under the bus? You know what I mean? Under the bus? My son paused. And he said, but I have to say how happy I am to be able to be part of both sides of the family. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, Baruch Hashem. But we each have two sides of the family. There's not a person I know, especially in our generation, but it's really from time immemorial, who doesn't often ask that question, who am I? Where do I come from? What is it that I need most? Why do I have anxiety? Does anybody have anxiety in Philadelphia? No. Oh. no. What about trauma? No, Russians don't have it. You say lechai. Americans go to therapy, right? Halavai, <laughs> halavai, I know. I come from Russian stock. I know everything, don't I? I know, I know about emotional constipation. Echveis, echveis, echveis. Aniyadeya, my dear brothers and sisters, we're in the same boat. We ask the question, what makes me tick? Who am I? What makes me sad? What makes me happy? What are my deepest cravings? What are my deepest yearnings? What are my deepest fears? What are my deepest insecurities? How would I live if I had no fear? How would I live if I could show up to relationships and emotions with my full presence? And I want to tell you something on a very personal note. We live today in a generation where we can't get away with things that we got away in the previous generation. Previous generation, you could parent your children and think that you don't need real emotional connection. You put down the rules. As long as you're a nice person, you're not an abusive monster, everybody will follow. Today the world and God has brought the world to a place where each and every one of us is challenged to find out who you are, what you're scared of, and what you're dealing with in your subconscious. And if you don't face it and I don't face it, my kids and your kids will force you to face it. Everybody knows the tradition at the Seder, where we, the parents, hide the afikom. You remember the matzah that you hide? And you need a good hiding place. And then who finds it? One of your children finds it. And then they want a prize. It used to be you gave them a calculator. Rockefeller did a Parker pen. 
If you're a multimillionaire, you did something expensive, most of us got a bag of chips. Today, if you buy your son or daughter a calculator, they'll call child services. They want a Lamborghini, at least a private yacht, a private jet. And if you're a schnorrer, a tablet. But what's the secret of this tradition? And the answer is, my dearest friends, open your hearts. Judaism is teaching us whatever we hide, our children are going to expose. And the deeper we hide it, the more powerful the exposure. And when they expose it, you could do one of two things. You could look at them in the face and say, you guys are messed up. Thank you for ruining a beautiful family. You could do that. You can also do something else. You can take it, give them a hug, and say thank you for the awareness. Thank you for helping us grow up. I met a child the other day, a teenager, he says, Rabbi Wawa, you think it's easy raising children today? Raising parents today? I told him Mark Twain said, when I was nine, my father was a genius. When I was 19, he was an idiot. Today I'm 29, I have a couple of kids. My father has so much wisdom. It's funny how much the old man learned in 10 years. <laughs> so this boy tells me, it's not easy raising parents. I can take that if come and look them in the eyes and say, thank you, my dear angels. And when you do that, together, you can declare the Shana Haba'ah. The Yerushalayim, next year we can be free. Not just physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. My mother once shared with me as a child. She said, I want to tell you something. I asked her. Who had it worse, the Jews under Stalin or the Jews under Hitler? Most Jews in the world don't know what happened to Soviet Jewry. The Holocaust was such a powerful story, it eclipsed every other story. Most people don't know that Stalin murdered more people than Hitler. Most people don't know that. Most people don't know that what the Yevsekzia did in nine years, from 1921 till 1930, the Russian Enlightenment didn't do in 200 years. What the Yevsekzia, which was the Jewish section of the Communist Party, did for Judaism, to Judaism in nine years, the Haskalah, the Enlightenment, didn't do in two centuries. And who was the head of the Yevsekzia? A man named Shimon Dimenstein. Shimon Dimenstein had smicha. He was an ordained rabbi, you know by whom? Some of you won't know the name, but some of you know the name. He was one of the greatest rabbis of the time. Reb Chaim Isaac Radzensky was the rabbi of Vilna. He ordained Shimon Dimenstein, who was a student of Tells, a student of Slabotka, a student of Lubavitch. These are great yeshivas, and he became the head of the Yevsekzia, mostly yeshiva boys, who in nine years uprooted every last vestige of Judaism in the Soviet Union in a way that couldn't be done in two and a half centuries. Of course, in 1938, Stalin killed the Minshteh, and by 1930, the Yevsekzi was dismantled because they were too Jewish, even though they successfully got rid of every last vestige of Judaism. Most people are unaware of the history of Soviet Jewry. Even Soviet Jews are unaware. And I remember my mother told me something very powerful. She said, Hitler murdered everybody. But what Stalin did was, besides the millions that he murdered, 40, 50 million people, besides that, he did something else. He destroyed the basic fabric of humanity with his family. Family is the fabric of humanity. Without family, there's no humanity. You have to be able to trust your mother. You have to be able to trust your father. You have to be able to trust your sister, brother. You have to be able to trust your child. This is not a contract. You didn't make a contract with your mother. It's not a contract between an employer and employee. It's where we learn what it means to be human. It's where we learn what love is, what attachment is, what identity is, what relationship is, what commitment is, what sacrifice is. But my mother said, we couldn't trust family. Your own brother informed on you and he was promoted in the party. How do you trust? You know, there was one day a Jew stood up in the Red Square and he screamed, Khrushchev is a Meshuganer. You know what a Meshuganer is, yeah? A Meshuganer. There's no translation. A Meshuganer. I could say an imbecile, but it doesn't work. A 
You know, in English, they have one word. In Yiddish, they have like 90 words, you know. A tzedreter, a idiot, a fed, a shmat, a kapsen, a chaler, a chaz, a behem, a sheret, whatever. A tzedreter, a verwundet, a tzedudelter, a batlen, a shlomazel, whatever. You can ask your grandmother, she'll translate. These are the words you grew up with, no? When you ask her about her brother. So, if you're... It, it, just a joke, just a joke. Your uncle is a nice guy. <laughs> Till you ask him for a loan. But in any case, what do you do when your own brother can inform on you? You know, today in psychology we know the worst trauma is when your primary caregivers molest you. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, sexually. Because the people you trust most, you form your identity by contact, by connection, by attachment. And when they destroy it, you sometimes revert to psychological nothingness. That pain is like no other pain. My mother said we had families. Your uncle can inform on you. Parents can inform on children. Children can inform on a father, on a mother. What happens to such people? It's not just the uprooted, they uprooted Judaism. They uprooted the basis upon which Judaism is based, which is family, love, loyalty, dedication, attachment. If you open up the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, what's the first thing the Torah says is not good? Lotov. What would you think would be the first thing Jewish religion would say is not good? Most people would say, Sin. Don't sin. Don't, don't ignore God. That's not the first thing that the Torah says is not good. You know what the first thing Judaism says is not good? I quote. It's not good for a human being to be alone. It's not good. The antithesis of addiction is not sobriety. The antithesis of addiction is connection. Why is it that if your grandmother, 86-year-old woman, broke her hip, she was in the hospital, they gave her morphine for three weeks. Essentially, they were giving her drugs. She comes home, she should have been a full-blown addict. She's not. You know why? Because she has 12 grandchildren jumping on her. When she comes home, because she's attached, she's connected. Because the antithesis of addiction is not sobriety. The antithesis of addiction is connection. The Torah understood that when God says it's not good for Adam to be alone. But for Adam not to be alone, we need trust. We need attachment. Those who have wounded attachments have wounded relationships. I see lots of people. And I see many divorces, unfortunately. And in my humble opinion, I'm not giving a statistic here from a laboratory, but in my humble opinion, most divorces that I see are not because of lack of compatibility. It's not because they're not compatible with each other. It's because of trauma, capital T. He is suffering inside. He cannot be in a relationship, or she can't be. And now they butt heads. Poor people, they're trying their best. It's not even under their control. They don't even know how broken they are. They go to their reptilian brain, their amygdala. They don't even know how to be in their prefrontal cortex. They don't even know about the prefrontal lobes. At four years old, what happened? I go into my stem, I go into my amygdala. I'm a reptile. Now your teenage kid comes home and triggers you. I'm in my reptilian brain. I can't call myself a father, I have to call myself a lizard, or a crocodile, or an alligator on a good day. Even if I'm in my limbic brain, okay, so I'm an elephant, a rat, a mouse, a chimpanzee, a gorilla. I'm not in executive functioning. How can you be in a relationship? It's very, very difficult. It's very, very primal stuff. We have to face all these things today. It's a gift, it's not a curse. It's a gift that we are challenged in our generation to create much deeper relationships with our spouses, 
with ourselves, with our children. And religion without awareness could also be dangerous. I know very many religious people, but they use religion to camouflage trauma. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? God is a great cover-up. I'm not angry at you. God is angry at you. <laughs> really? When you use religion to cover up trauma, it's very dangerous. Because you're using something transcendent and holy to cover up my insecurity and inability to be able to deal with life. So there's this Jew, I forgot to tell you the story, he's in the red square and he screams, Khrushchev is a Meshuggah. You forgot already, right? You're all ADHD like me. 60%, huh? The other 40% on steroids. ADHD stands for attention deficit. Hey, donuts. They're coming. Don't worry, they're coming. They're power of they're good. Anyway, Khrushchev. Is the you don't know, you know who Khrushchev is? This Jew gets up in the red square and screams, Khrushchev is a Meshugane! Immediately, you know, it's in Russia. Putin didn't change it much. Within three seconds, he's under arrest. He's in the Spalerke, in the Spalerke, in Moscow. And right away, there's a trial within a few hours. And of course, you know, the kangaroo courts in Russia don't have to tell you. He's given two life sentences in the Gulag. Two. So the Jew gets up and he says, Your Honor, I understand one life sentence, but why two? I just said, Khrushchev is a Meshuggah He said, because you committed two crimes. The first thing is, you insulted a head of state. The second thing is, you revealed a state secret. <laughs> two life sentences. I want you to therefore understand. I want you to understand. The miracle that we were all witnesses of, and we are witnesses of, when people, when Jews and people, can take a story that is traumatic and difficult and decide to create a new chapter. I heard from the former chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau. He said, it was 1989, Gorbachev allowed the Iron Curtain to fall. Gorbachev zachel atayv. And so many came to Israel and to America and other places, as many of you. And there was a big question, who's Jewish, who's not Jewish, who's coming for the ride, who's coming for the shwama, who's coming for the lafa, who's coming for the ice cream, who's coming because the stability of Israeli governments, <laughs> you know, competing with Russia for a different reason, but whatever. <laughs> by the way, by the way, the, one of the reasons most Jews don't know about Soviet history is because many Jewish intellectuals were enamored by Stalin and socialism till a few years ago. That's one of the reasons. They thought it's a Ghanaian over there, a paradise. You know, it was a hell, but they thought it was a paradise. In any case, so Rabbi Lau, I heard a story from Rabbi Lau. There was a Russian young man, he came in, and he wanted a certificate from the rabbinate that he's a full Jew. So Rabbi Lau says, do you have a witness? So he says, yeah, I have a witness. And he calls in an old Lubavitcher, an old Chabad Choset, to come into the office, and he comes in, and Rabbi Lau says, you know him? He says, I don't know him, but I know his mother very well. And I was at his bris, he's a Jew. Rabbi Lau says, could you say anything else? She says, he says to Rabbi Lau, yeah, let me tell you something. His mother was a doctor in a hospital in Moscow and had a very, very good job. Because she had a good job, she was privy to a special gift. She got two cigarettes a day. Two cigarettes a day. Unbelievable. One cigarette she would smoke. The second cigarette, she put into a special suitcase and sealed it under her bed. Once a year, in March, she would come to me, this old Chabad Chosid from Samarikand, Uzbekistan, says to Rabbi Lau, she would come to me 
with the suitcase. She would open it up. It had 365 cigarettes. Because she put away one cigarette every day. 365 cigarettes. She said, here. And I knew what that meant. I sell it on the black market. And with the money, I purchase pure flour to bake matzah for Passover. For her to eat matzah for herself and her children confidentially in her sealed apartment so that she wouldn't be fired as a doctor. So this old chassa tells Rabbi Lau, that's his mother. You think that's enough to think she's Jewish? <clears throat> Rabbi Lau started to cry. He says, is your mother alive? He says, yeah, where is she? She's in Moscow, she's an old woman, it's 1989. Rabbi Lau says, does she have a telephone in the house? She has a telephone in the house, she got a telephone. Can they call her? Yeah. Call her, I wanna to speak to her. So the son calls her, his mother in Moscow, from Jerusalem, calls his mother in Moscow, and says, the chief rabbi of Israel wants to speak to you. Wow, what an honor. He gets, she gets on the phone, and Rabbi Lau says, your, 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 your friend, this Chabadnik, just told me the story about the cigarettes. She says, yeah, it's true, that's how we have matzah every year. So Rabbi Lau looks at her, and he doesn't look at her, he speaks to her on the phone, and weeping, he says, you know, what type of Jew do you call yourself? And she says, oh, I'm not a religious Jew, I'm not like you, I know nothing. He said, I want to tell you something. The Torah says that you should remember the day you left Egypt every day of your life. So most of us, like robots, we say, yeah, yeah, we left Egypt, we left Egypt. He says, you're the first person in my life that I have met who celebrated Pesach every day of the year and who remembers the Exodus every day. I remember the Exodus when I sit at the Seder. You put away a cigarette every day. Remembering the Jewish journey from slavery to freedom. He says, wow, I have never met such a person in my life. You think about that. That some of your parents, grandparents, you, under crazy circumstances, crazy, kept that little flame burning, even if it looked like putting away a cigarette, to be able to purchase matzah. And here today, just a few decades later, if you ask the question, where's Stalin? Where's Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Andropov, Berya, Yezhov, Kaganovich? Where are the Romanovs? Where is Titus, the Vilchadnezzar, Pharaoh, Haman, Caliglia, Pompey, Caesar, Adrian, Tiberius? Where is Hitler, Rosenberg, Eichmann, Himmler, Goebbels, Arafat, Nasrallah? Where are all these people? The answer is they are in Wikipedia. <laughs> They're all there. And now you'll ask a question, where is the Jewish people? Where are the Jewish people? And the answer is we created Wikipedia. <laughs> and Google. And Telegram and Instagram and Waze. We're trying to buy off Amazon. <laughs> Why did we create Wikipedia? Because we wanted to write the obituary of our enemies. You could open a Wikipedia as I'm talking. If you're ADHD, you should do it anyway. You're probably doing it. Go to Heyman and you can edit his obituary. How beautiful. We, we like having the last word. <laughs> Churchill said, history will be kind to me because I plan. <laughs> That's one explanation. What's the big deal? You know, still today, if you go into AA when they finish drinking and they're looking for a minion. Oh, you missed that, okay. They're looking for a minion. They don't go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know what they do? Baruch ato Hashem lekeinu melech ha'olam ha'moitzi lechem min ha'aretz. Ha'ashiyah esamech. What's this? We're just count people. 
but I'll tell you the reason. The reason is very deep. Why do we count people? Why does any nation or company make a census? You want to flex your muscles. If you have a company with 10,000 people, it's powerful. If you have a country with a million troops, I don't start up with you. If you have a workforce of hundreds of thousands of people, the taxes and the contributions are much more powerful. God knew that if Jews are going to start counting themselves, they're going to go into a depression. We're going to look at ourselves and say, we don't even make up a quarter of 1%. How can we survive? Never mind, how can we have a contribution and an impact? So God told Moses, never count Jews. Never. How do you count them? Say no. Count their contributions. When you want to understand the Jewish people, don't look at them. Look at their contributions to humanity, to history. And then you'll have an appreciation of the power that exists within the Jewish soul that can't be stifled or crushed. I once saw a Christian writer, he said, people blame Jews for calling themselves the chosen people. He wrote something so profound. He says, people don't realize that if you actually study the contribution of the Jewish people, when they call themselves the chosen people, it's the humblest way of explaining how they achieved so much under impossible circumstances. It's the humblest explanation. When they say, we're the chosen people, somebody chose us. <laughs> don't give me credit. He said, don't you realize that's the most humble of explanations? Nobody understood this better than a man who died two weeks ago, Paul Johnson, whose book, The History of the Jews, he wasn't a Jew, but his book, The History of the Jews, is one of the best contributions to Jewish history because he understood a lot of things that even Jews don't understand about themselves. Because one of the casualties of anti-Semitism has been not just that Gentiles hate Jews, but another casualty, Jews don't like Jews. And that's very deep. Self-hatred is the deepest form of trauma. When I can't accept myself, when I don't believe I deserve love, when Jews blame themselves for being targeted, that is trauma, capital T. When we apologize for our existence, Dr. Tversky, who died recently, the great psychiatrist, would tell the story. He was once on an airplane, and he was dressed like a Hasidic Jew. You know how the Hasidim are dressed? You don't know, you never saw them? Huh? So I'll tell you, they have a round black hat, square white beard, right? Long black coat. I'm like a fake hybrid. I'm talking about the real ones. Long black coat, square white beard, round black hat, Everything black. A woman was sitting near him on the plane. She speaks to him in Yiddish and she says, You're the cause of anti Semitism. In Yiddish, if you would dress normally, if you would be normal, if you would speak normal, if you would look normal, they wouldn't hate us. But you have to stand out. You have to be different. That's why they hate us. Dr. Tversky looks at her, perplexed, and he says, Which language are you communicating in? She says, Yiddish. He says, oh, I'm so sorry. I failed to comprehend the dialect of your verbiage. She says, why? He says, I am Amish. <laughs> she looks at him and she says, I am so sorry. I thought you were Hasidic. He says, that's so sweet. No, I'm Amish. I live not far, Pennsylvania. You could come visit us. I'll give you a beautiful horse ride for Chalamayat. <laughs> and you say, hey, this is a horse. This is how they used to live. These are Amish in their natural habitat, right? And they always say, you want to see Jews in their natural habitat? Miami. <laughs> Especially since Corona. Not New York anymore, Miami. Okay, Boca. The Hamptons, maybe. And then she looks at him and she says, oh, you're Amish. I apologize, I apologize. You know, she says, I love the Amish. He says, that's so sweet, why? She says, you're a minority, but you maintain your heritage <laughs> with pride and dignity and courage, courage. Wow. Kudos unto the Amish. He looks at her, it was his turn to respond in Yiddish. He says, aha, I bechvold given Amish. Hasta mechlib. 
If I would have been Amish, you'd love me. Now that I'm Jewish, you're embarrassed by me. I want to bless you. You should be able to cherish in your own people what you cherish in other people. You should be able to respect yourself like you respect others. You should be able to believe in your choices and to believe that your people are not as disgusting and as stupid and as illiterate and as uneducated as you may think. And I'll tell you something else. Till four generations ago, till five generations ago, you take any Jew in the world, you give me the most greatest atheist anti-religious Jew in the world, just five generations ago. You know what his Zayda looked like? You know what his grandmother looked like? His grandmother lit Shabbos candles. His Zayda wrapped filling in the morning. There was a beautiful Shabbos table where they sang. Go back five generations, it'll be hard. You want six, maybe six. And they did this for a few thousand years. So there's nobody disconnected. But when we live through the traumas of exile, we start hating ourselves and blaming ourselves and blaming our family. And it's normal, we can't judge anybody. But we have to be able to celebrate the miracle of all those people who could face the adversity and say, we are choosing to empower ourselves to choose relationship, to choose family, to choose connection, to choose identity, to choose faith, to choose heritage, to choose education, to choose connection with thousands of years of a people that nobody can exterminate and nobody can destroy through thick and thin. Zayid knew. Jews always knew our power is not numbers. Don't count numbers. If you were a fly on the wall in 1924 when Vladimir Lenin kicked the bucket and Stalin took over in 24, or you were a fly on the wall in March 53 when Stalin died and Khrushchev took over, or in other generations and you would look and you would say, huh, a few Jews who are still holding on to their heritage against hundreds of millions of people. What a joke. It's like a bug fighting a tank or an F-16. And then a few years ago when I was in Moscow and I went to the Red Square and I looked at the mausoleum of Lenin and Stalin. And Rabbi Lazar from Moscow had 3,000 children on Lagba Omer in the Red Square they put their hands on their eyes. 3,000 children. And they said, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echod. And I have to say, forgive me, I felt so bad for Stalin. <laughs> Not really. I felt so bad for Lenin. These two poor guys right here. Mamish a few feet away. This is what they have to hear. 90 years later. This is what happened. To Trotsky, Leon Trotsky's Revolutia! His real name was Leibala Bronstein. And when he began persecuting the Jews, the rabbi of Moscow, Yaakov Maze, by the way, Jackie Mason's name was Yaakov Maze, he changed it. Allah Shalom. He's the guy who would repeat my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Yaakov Maze went to visit Trotsky, and he tells Trotsky, Bistayid, you're a yid. How are you allowing the, the civil war between the reds and the whites killed hundreds of thousands of Jews? How are you allowing this? And Trotsky looks at him and says, I'm not a Jew anymore. I'm not a Jew anymore. My name is not Bronstein. My name is Trotsky. I would have been quiet, but the credit of the chief rabbi of Moscow, he looked at him and he says, that's the problem with all of you. He says, the Trotsky's machen al the Trotskys are the ones that create chaos. They wreak havoc. And the Bronsteins are the ones blamed. Nobody else thinks you're not Jewish. How right was he when in August 1940, Stalin made sure to have Trotsky axed? In August 1940 in Mexico, the great revolutionary remained a Jew. 
and I met his great-grandson, who lives in Israel, in one of the liberated territories, and still has the fire of his great-grandfather in his eyes, but he puts on tefillin. He wears tzitzis. He celebrates Shabbos, and he gives his children an education. I felt a little bad for Trotsky, but then I said, ah, that's an evolution! That's an evolution! That's revolution! You know, friends, there's somebody who was in my house a few years ago, grew up in Russia, left after the fall of communism, had a very, very hard life in Russia, like so many, the starvation, the hatred, the anti-Semitism, the difficult circumstances. Came to America, started a new life. And one day, in 2008, Gorbachev was invited here to Philadelphia to receive the Liberty Honor, you remember? Gorbachev. And this Jewish Russian woman went to the event at the Constitution Center. You get it? Anyway, she was in one of the places where you meet prime ministers privately, without bodyguards, I won't specify. And Gorbachev comes out and he's alone. He's alone. So this Jewish Russian woman goes over to him and says, Michal Gorbachev, I can't thank you enough. Because of you, I'm a Jew. If I would have been stuck in Russia, I had to hide my Jewishness. Because of you, I'm here, I'm a Jew. Give me your autograph. Give me your autograph. Gorbachev looked at her and he said, Tvoya, Zizid, Moya, Aftograph. Your life is my autograph. That's what he said. I heard this from the woman herself. She's here, her name is Sonia Tomarkin. <laughs> may, I, may I paraphrase the words of Gorbachev and say, Vasha Zhizhin, Oftograph Boga. Your lives is God's autograph. When you look at the eternity of the Jewish people and of Judaism, you see the autograph of the Creator all over it. So I say to you tonight, Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazek. May you continue to be a light unto yourselves, your families, your communities, your friends, and the whole Jewish world. Because your lives is God's autograph. Thank you very much.